to, I should say, the Indian Rhino exhibit, and we're debuting our male Indian Rhino calf that was born on the 13th of July, uh, a male. This is our second now at Tampa's Lowry Park Zoo, and I have uh, Angela with me today, and Angela, uh, you were here when the, when the calf was born, so tell us, uh, tell us how quickly that birth occurred. It happened pretty fast. She went into labor at about 7 and she was born at about 7.45, I believe, and 10 minutes after he was born, he was standing, and 10 minutes after that, he took his first steps. That's incredible. Uh, now, these, these calves are born at about 80 to 90 pounds at birth, and then he'll gain about 100 pounds a month for the first 12 months of his life. And this is an endangered species, and we're, we're supporting the Species Survival Program uh, of the American Zoo Association to support uh, this very critically endangered animal. So this is her second calf, and have you seen any difference between uh, the way she uh, uh, takes care of this calf and her first? She's more comfortable with this calf since it's her second, um, but she is a little bit more protective. And the first calf was a female, and she was seemed to be a little bit more outgoing, a little more trusting of staff, came right up. This little boy is very cautious doesn't like mom to be out of his sight, um, will come over and visit staff, but is quick to move away as soon as mom walks, walks away. Now the male, the father of this calf, is actually uh, in an adjacent exhibit. We don't put them together. Uh, he comes in here in the evening and, and has the exhibit to himself in the evening, and, and they have the back area in the evening to themselves. So we keep them separated purposely. Now we will rebreed this pair. The Species Survival Program has said, yes, please go ahead and breed again. They're a good pair. Uh, she's an excellent mother, uh, and and this calf I noticed from day one is just he just has different attitude. I don't know whether that's the the male part of him or not, but he just seems to be a, a different personality all the way around. Have you had a chance to weigh him since he was born? No, we have not. He's not been quite comfortable enough to stay away from Jamie long enough to get onto the weight board, and he's not quite um, eating solids yet. And I think once we start that, once he gets a little taste of cooked sweet potato, he's going to be much more willing to walk away from Jamie me and climb on the board but we are starting to acclimate him to to the, sure. that board these animals uh, you know they are grazers typically but they'll also eat uh, vegetation you see the hook lift on their face and that helps them strip branches off trees now they have uh, literature indicates they have something like t the ten distinct vocalizations, and, and you've probably heard some of that. And it, and I, they're all a little bit different, aren't they? Mm -hmm, they are a lot yeah. different. Yeah, um, yeah and they, they actually vocalize more when they're getting into breeding season, or to warn the baby might um, make some vocals if he gets a little concerned that mom's not in the area. Mom actually has become a little bit more vocal as she might start to cycle again, mm -hmm. and the male is doing the same. And there's there's no question of when they're interested, you, you know they're interested, but when they're aggressive, you also know that too, but they, they are very vocal. Sometimes first thing in the morning before the zoo's open, you can hear them actually, what we'll sometimes term whistling back and forth to one another. Now they live in very dense habitat, a very uh, tropical habitat, and oftentimes uh, during the breeding season, the female actually vocalizes to call the male in because the males are, you know, out wandering around and uh, they will use their dung as markers for their trail so they know that's kind of their road map as they go through the forest so very interesting animal now even that very thick armor they have uh, they are susceptible to sunburning so we'll see them actually wallowing quite a bit here when you come out here you'll see the exhibit and a wallow in it uh, that's all part of their their habitat I bet you they enjoy that wallow a lot they don't they love the wallow yeah. Indian rhinos are actually one of the most aquatic of the rhinos and they, so they thoroughly enjoy um, whether it be wallowing or getting into the water and the mud serves to protect for biting bugs and that kind of thing as well well, now you're hearing some of that vocalization right now. The male and the female are talking to one another. And uh, he might have just got a little too close to the calf as far as she's <laughs> concerned. The other, uh, the other thing that we'll see here is that there's quite a bit of talking and going back and forth. And it looks, uh, it looks a little frightening, but that's how Indian rhinos manage one another. It's, uh, uh, you got s about 6,000 pounds with the female, about 7,000 pounds with the male. So 
a lot going on. Now, you notice right now the calf is standing behind mother during this dispute. Uh, that's because he knows that's the safest place to be. He's got 6,000 pounds to, to back him up if anything were to happen. Is there any other unique issues uh, that, uh, you know, in managing this animal? Um, well, I can talk a little bit as far as management goes. Yeah, you, you need to be careful of where you are in this exhibit at all times, especially during this time where Jamie is extremely yeah. protective of this, this kid. Uh, but all in all, comparing the, the babies, if I can go back to that for yeah, a second, sure. Um, compared to the female calf that was born two years ago, he is considerably larger than she was, even at birth. So he was really filled out from out of the womb. Yeah. And whereas the, the, uh, the female calf was a little lankier, skin sort of hung on her a little bit more, which is actually more typical. So he's, he's pretty beefy. He's on the beefy side. Well, he'll, he'll be here for about two years before we then move him to wherever he's best suited in the, uh, in the gene pool. And then he'll eventually be a breeding, a breeding male in another facility. And that's part of the SSP plan is that our part is to produce the calves so we can perpetuate this species uh, long term. Well, thank you, Angela. Folks, the next time you're at the zoo, come to the Asian Gardens and, and visit the Indian Rhino exhibit and see our newest Indian Rhino.